This is CPSC 526-626, lecture number 10 on TCP, the Transmission Control Protocol. So this should all be familiar to you, having taken networks. Let's just quickly review what TCP is. TCP is the protocol that transports most of the traffic on the internet. It overcomes the fact that the internet is rife with delays, lost packets, packets that might arrive out of order or multiple times and allows for two different machines to have multiple streams of communication which is separated by ports so imagine virtual ports which connect different computers the header for tcp which comes after ip has the following fields as you can see this is taken from the rfc so if you want to understand this in full detail you can search for the tcp rfc the request for comments, which is effectively the description of how the, the protocol works. It's called request for comments, but typically at the point where there is an RFC, comments aren't actually relevant anymore. This is the specification. It consists of a packet saying the source port, the destination port. So this can identify multiple TCP streams of communication between the same pair of computers. A sequence number, which indicates there's going to be some data here. What position does this data fit into the stream? The acknowledgement number, which is in contrast, the reverse, it basically says, I've received from you this amount of data. The acknowledgement refers to the amount of data relative to the sequence number from the peer, that is the other person sending data, their sequence number gets acknowledged by, by you saying, I've received data up to this position from you. So every packet contains the sequence number indicating the data that you're sending and the acknowledgement saying what data you've received. Then there's some flags, a reserved field. Um, the flags can indicate whether or not you're resetting the connection, basically saying, I don't, I'm not expecting this. I don't know about this connection. I reset. A synchronization, a SYN field saying, like, let's start a new communication, and a FIN, a, fin a final close the connection. So those are the one bit flags that you can see spelt vertically the urgent, the ACK, whether or not there's an acknowledgement, a push, whether or not you're pushing data, reset, SYN, and FIN. The window indicates how much data you're willing to receive. And the idea here is that the sender of data will respect your window. They, they don't need to, there's no law that says you'll respect, you'll respect the window field, but the window is a helpful suggestion that one cooperating TCP sender can send to another cooperating TCP sender to say, hey, this is how much data my operating system can hold until the user reads from the buffers. So don't send more than this because if you do, it'll be a waste of bandwidth. So don't do it. The checksum, which is provided for error correcting, then options and padding, and finally the data. The actual stream data. So all of this header is removed, and what the application reads when they do a read on the socket is just what the data is. All of the header is there to support the reliable, in-order, guaranteed delivery of data. Here is an example of the state machine for a TCP connection. And again, this should all be review, but a socket can be opened. There's a SYN followed by a SYN ACK, followed by an ACK. At that point, it is established. Data can be sent back and forth. And then finally, you close the connection. When you close the connection, you send a FIN, if you receive a FIN, you send an ACK, and you send, then you finish sending your own data, and then you send your own FIN. So one side can close the connection. They can say, hey, I'm done sending data, FIN, but you might still have data to send. So you're not, you don't have to send a FIN just because you've received one. They just said, I'm done sending data on my side. I'm never going to send you any more data unless they open a new TCP connection. Whereas you can continue to finish sending your data and then fin at your own leisure. And at any point, if a reset occurs, the whole thing returns back to normal. A reset ends all communication. It basically 
would be equivalent to a computer booting up and receiving a TCP packet after the establishment phase and basically having no idea, no record of the sin, no record of the act, no idea of what's going on. Because the interesting thing as well with these TCP connections is they don't actually need to be kept alive. Now, in practice, they are, because if you just don't use the TCP connection, the operating system may shut it down. But in principle, you can just turn your computer off if you maintained its state, like uh, 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 like a hibernation state, and years later, reopen it and continue communicating with the same TCP connection. Because there's no sense of a timer that makes the state machine act any faster than it needs to. As long as both machines are synchronized and they're both expecting the same data and they have the same SYN numbers and they're sending data, TCP connections can continue years or decades later completely unbothered by this delay. Now, in practice, this won't occur because the operating system has a tendency to close down connections that aren't transmitting any data. But nevertheless, there's nothing in the TCP protocol itself that specifies a timeline by which these connections must die. This is an example of the sequence number. When a TCP connection is established, an initial sequence number, an ISN, they're called, is sent on both sides. So the client and the host or the server, they'll both provide their sequence numbers. These are just chosen at random. And the sequence number represents one byte less than the first byte that will be sent. So if you establish a sequence number of x, then x plus 1 will refer to the first byte that you actually send. And the window represents how much data beyond your current sequence number that you've acknowledged you're willing to accept. So given an initial sequence number, there's data you've received, this is in green, received, acknowledged, and you've delivered to the application that actually wants it. Then there's data that the operating system has received in full, in sequence, but has not yet delivered to the app because they haven't called read, for example. Apps don't need to read it as soon as it arrives. In fact, an app couldn't know that it has arrived. The operating system buffers it until the app reads it. And the operating system, if it runs out of buffer, can't hold anymore. And this is the purpose of the window. So the window represents all of the data that has been received by the operating system, but not yet rendered to the application. Then within it is the data that's received, but not yet acknowledged. Meaning that there has not yet been a reply TCP packet that says, I've received this data. One might be soon forthcoming. And then finally, unfilled buffer, meaning that basically zeros or whatever happened to be there, data that's not yet filled. So room for more for more data to arrive. And if the unfilled buffer reaches zero, the window is full, no more data can be stored, incoming packets are ignored, and this is why the window operates to say, hey, don't send me more data, I can't, I can't store it at the moment. And the window slides like a clock. As more data is written, the the, the window slides forwards, the green part increases, and this is why it's, it's, it's called a window, as it moves through the space of sequence number, which are 32-bit wide. There are two ways to close a TCP connection. One is with a fin. So you send a fin, this is allows for the half-open connection, one side fins, then the other side fins, both are acknowledged. It's the nice, polite way to end a TCP connection. It consists of, in program, you calling close on the socket. So the socket is actually closed with a system call. And both sides agree, in a sense, that yes, we're done talking. The other is a reset. This is unilateral. This would be if you receive something and you say, I don't know who you are, new phone, who dis, this is the idea of you have no idea what this means. And it takes immediate effect. There's no acknowledgement. Any further communication is also met with a reset. 
And the only the the only thing that matters is that the socket is then just effectively dead. There's no more communication that can occur after a reset has occurred. So now let's consider some attacks on TCP. So one is a reset attack. Because we just pointed out, and again, the design of TCP was meant to allow internet communication given how unreliable it was. It wasn't to protect against reset attacks, which would be that any packet sent to either Alice or Bob with a reset just ends the connection, which means that Eve can easily interfere with the communication. Now, going back to what the reset control message was, you have to reset with a reasonable sequence number, meaning that if Bob sends Alice some data with a sequence number, Alice can send back a reset, but with the same sequence number, so that Bob knows that Alice is resetting the packet that he, he had just sent. It's not the case that a reset on its own, without any context, without any reasonable sequence number, that would be, for instance, not in response to a message being delivered in the first place, would necessarily be accepted. But if there is a packet that is sent with a sequence number, and it is replied to not with an acknowledgement, but with a re reset with that same sequence number, then it will be accepted by the operating system. And this allows Eve to interfere with communication. If Eve knows the port and a reasonable sequence number, then Eve can interfere with communication. Now this is of course trivial for a sniffer, an on-path attacker, because an on-path attacker will know a port and a reasonable sequence number. And a reasonable sequence number would be one within the window, one within, a, 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 you can imagine a negative window within data that had recently been sent, for example. And ports aren't meant to be having a security function against reset attacks, right? One side is usually known. It's AD for HTTP, it's 443 for TLS. But whatever data is sent after a reset packet is accepted is then rejected by design of the TCP protocol. So this is an attack on availability. This is a denial of service attack. By sending a single packet, if you can either guess the sequence number or you know it because you're on path, you can shut down communication. This is not an existential threat. Reset attacks exist. This is one of the techniques that is used to do censorship. Now, the sole use of reset attacks is no longer the case. So this was uh, from maybe 15 years ago or so. Uh, now the, the firewall is, of course, much more comprehensive. But at the time, there was a study, a research study, which simply observed that you could ignore the reset packets. If both sides decided to just ignore the reset packets that were sent, they would be able to easily continue communication. Um, there are some caveats there, but according to their study, what they found is they could do a since, an ack ack, and then if they just did a get request for included the word Falun, which was some religious movement, it would immediately trigger a response from the firewall of the country that did not approve of this particular uh, piece of information being existing in, in, as a keyword in a packet. So they were just looking at all the packets. If they found this keyword, they would send a reset. But the original server would just continue to send the data. So if you just told your TCP implementation to ignore resets when you're talking to this particular country, then you would be able to receive the information that you had intended to get. They also did notice, though, however, 
that if a particular packet was flagged as you know, containing information that was uh, of concern to the state, then it would effectively deny communication for new connections than after. So all it would take was a single packet to, and it could have a forged source IP, as, as we know, to effectively disable information coming from that particular IP. So they could disable the ability to access updates from Windows updates, for example, by pretending that Windows updates IP addresses sent a request for information about the Falun religious movement. Or, as they pointed out, block access to by embassies abroad based on effectively using this firewall that was intentionally disabling service against it by so forging the source IPs. And this was not just used for state-level censorship. This was also used by the large ISP in the United States, Comcast, to throttle BitTorrent, which was used uh, frequently to download large files and sometimes occasionally for pirated materials as well. And with Comcast, they were basically selling more bandwidth than they had. They were promising a certain rate of bandwidth under the assumption that no one's using it all the time. And they were selling it without any caveats that, well, you won't get this all the time. You, you get this bandwidth. That was their claim. But if you used it all the time, then Comcast could not actually fulfill their end of the contract. So what they started to do was realize, well, some traffic needs to be removed so that other traffic can, be, can exist. So they decided some traffic is bad, like BitTorrent, and some traffic is not bad, and then they tried to disable all the bad traffic. And had they done that without using reset attacks, that might have been one aspect, uh, that, that might have been one reasonable way of implementing this policy. They say, hey, you know, we can't allow all of this traffic because we've intentionally oversold, overbooked our network, so we'll just sell based on or, or, or we'll just throttle what we can so everyone gets a fair share and, you know, a prompt video calls are more important or interactive web browsing and we'll slow down the actual BitTorrent traffic and, you know, this is where this, this political movement of net neutrality sort of emerged from. But the thing is, what Comcast did was actually insert reset packets. So it's not the case that they just identified traffic that they disapproved of and slowed it down. But they were active man-in-the-middle attackers doing exactly the same thing that state-level censorship was doing to disable communication of protocols that they happened to find inconvenient for their profit. Which the FCC decided was actually illegal because they are active adversaries now. This is not a no longer simply net neutrality where they're just choosing to slow down some traffic, but they were going out of their way to insert fake packets so that computers would behave differently so that they wouldn't suffer from having oversold their bandwidth. The next attack is data injection. The idea here is that you can actually insert data, not just deny service. Because if you know the correct port and sequence number, you can just send whatever data you want. There's no authentication. This is why we have things like TLS, so that you can't actually do this. TCP on its own, if you send a packet with the correct sequence number and the correct port, then that data will be accepted by the operating system and put into the buffer, and whatever data comes first will be accepted. If 
you receive two packets with the same port and sequence number and they contain different information, there's no way for the operating system to decide which is correct. Or even to decide whether or not an attack is actually happening. This might happen easily. Packets can get corrupted. Packets do arrive out of order or might arrive more than once. There's retransmissions. This is part of TCP. So there's no way of detecting that this is occurring. And the operating system certainly won't buffer all of the data it ever receives and compare across versions to see if there's any differences because this isn't its job. Its job is to get the data from the packet, deliver it to the application. So whatever data comes first, that's the data that gets there. If you need security, that's at a higher level, TLS. And of course, the source IP can easily be spoofed. So as long as the attacker knows a port and sequence number, they can inject data. And this is known as connection hijacking or session hijacking if you just simply take over an established connection. So there's a sin, an ack, ack and maybe there's some data that is exchanged. And then afterwards... Maybe you DOS that machine, you DOS Bob, so Bob shuts off and he won't send resets if he realizes that weird stuff is happening. And Eve can just completely take over Bob as long as Eve is on path and can see the responses. So as to be able to send reasonable acknowledgments to Alice. So how does this look like? Alice goes to Bob, source IP to sor and source port to dest IP dest port. Sequence number X, acknowledgement Y, HTTP get login.html. This would just be a standard HTTP request. No TLS, so there's no security. Eve then replies exactly what Alice expects to see. Dest IP, dest port to source IP, source port. Sequence number Y, I'm acknowledging X plus 20, which is the length of the data that Alice sent. And, rep and then adds as data... H200, okay, you know, HTTP return code, and then you, whatever data Eve wants to send. Shortly after, if Bob is alert, if Bob received Alice's information, if Eve isn't necessarily on path with the ability to delete Bob's traffic, but let's say Eve just got lucky and guessed the sequence number and injected the packet, as Eve can easily do, Bob will send his legitimate reply. Sequence number Y, acknowledgement X plus 20, 200 OK, and the actual data. But as long as Eve beat Bob in this race, which Eve can do if at least Eve not necessarily is on path, but is privileged to see the traffic before Bob does, then Eve will always be able to reply faster. If it, if it goes near Eve and Eve can inject the traffic faster than Bob can, then Bob's reply is then ignored. And of course, the operating system doesn't have the resources and shouldn't have the resources to ch manually check every single packet that's ever received against every other packet that's received and issue warnings if there's some sort of discrepancy like this. So instead, Al or Eve's information is accepted, Bob's is rejected. And this technique can be used to spoof an entire session. Sin, Sinak, the whole exchange of information, and everything. And it allows an attacker to blame a client for a particular behavior. So Eve could, for instance, pretend to be Alice and do some attack traffic on Bob. Perhaps mount a SQL injection attack, which we'll talk about later on in this course. And Bob will then say, ah... Law officers, this was done by Alice, but in fact it was done by Eve. It allows the attacker to receive IP-based credibility, which I don't know if that's still a thing, but it used to be, where if your IP was, for instance, on campus, you could access the library and download resources for the library um, just by having an IP that looked like it came from somewhere on campus. So if there's any services that are based around IP-based credibility and you can spoof the entire session reliably, you'll be able to receive that credibility. 
So that is a non-blind attack, in a sense. Because in order to actually receive the response and have a meaningful communication, you're going to have to actually be able to be on path and, and or witness to the traffic in some way. But what about blind injection? Is it possible for an attacker to inject into a TCP connection even if they can't see? They don't know the, the sequence number. They don't know what to acknowledge. They don't know the replies. They don't know anything at all. They're just throwing packets out into the wind. And the answer is yes. They just have to be lucky with the sequence number. And think, sequence numbers are 32 bits. They weren't meant to be critical security features. They weren't meant... They weren't designed for this. The only thing preventing Eve from doing a blind injection attack is the fact that she's likely to not know the sequence number and the port. And if the port is with the server having a protocol, like port 80, port 443, then Eve will know the port. And if Eve knows the entire sequence of communication that will occur, Eve doesn't even need to know the reply. If all Eve needs to do is just say, delete all the files on the server, because that's a single command, that's, that's fine. Ports and sequence numbers weren't designed to fight the, this threat. That's why they're not that large. Ports are 16 bits. Sequence numbers are 32 bits. These are not cryptographically secure. If we were to have a implementation of TCP with the idea that we want to make blind injection cryptographically impossible, we would have 128-bit sequence numbers and 128-bit ports. But TCP was designed with the idea that there aren't attackers. Let's just plug our computers on the happy internet because it's a bunch of researchers around the world who just want to share their com information with each other. And how cool is that we can talk to each other easily? And bits are expensive, so why waste so many bits on a sequence number and a port? We don't need that many. 32 is enough, and 16 is enough for the port. So with blind spoofing, again, you can spoof an entire session, not just a packet. If you can anticipate the replies, you can just keep talking. You don't know what's being said. It could be a reset, but that doesn't bother you in a sense. You can keep trying. If that one reset, you try again with a different sequence number. You can just keep trying over and over and over and over. 32 bits isn't that big. If you're allowing yourself two to the 32 tries to do this attack, you'll, you'll succeed. And protocols help. Protocols for the defenders means that they have to follow certain rules which the attacker knows and can anticipate. And again, we don't design protocols like FTP or HTTP with the idea that we're going to challenge the person making these requests so that we know that they are actually reading these replies. Again, it's not the job of the person who's designing a proto an internet protocol to figure out to have every single protocol fight these particular threats. Instead, we just use TLS to secure them because TCP has too many attacks against it. But blind spoofing isn't easy for the attack. For one, the attacker, or the, the victim rather, the one that receives the packet, will send a reply to the original intended IP. So Eve is impersonating Alice talking to Bob. Alice will receive a reset. Or rather, Alice will receive the data from Bob and then reply with a reset. Now, Eve could make sure that she's impersonating an IP that's unreachable. Or Eve could try to do everything in a hurry, like have the entire session begin and end before the, the first reset gets there. 
And again, as we sort of alluded to, problem two, the attacker doesn't see the replies. The attacker will never know the sin number to ACK. If, if Eve is uh, initiating the co uh, communication, sending a sin to Bob, Bob replies with the sin ACK, Eve knows the ACK, because that's the protocol, but Eve does not know Bob's sin. So how can Eve figure it out? Well, we mentioned that 2 to the 32 isn't cryptographically secure, but it actually gets easier. Because, again, these were not meant to be secure. These attacks were not being considered in the design of TCP. So the idea of a sequence number was just to pick a random number and have it as the sequence number in case where you had the situation, you create a socket with a port and something goes wrong. So you create a new one with the same port and you want a different sequence number. So that acts as a fail safe to tell it apart. So originally sequence numbers were based on the clock. making it very easy to predict. They weren't random. They weren't selected random. They were just selected to be different. So if Eve, for instance, had the sequence number that Alice has recently used, then Eve would pretty much know what Alice would use next. Now, nowadays, we use randomized ones, but this is a result of these attacks. Because the idea of simply using the current time or some function of the current time represented this naivety of these attacks don't exist, the internet is a happy place, why would we need to have randomized ISNs? Another attack is known as a sin flood. The idea here is that if Eve goes to a server and says, Hi, I'd like to start a TCP connection with you. Here's my sequence number. The server then replies, All right, here's my sequence number. I acknowledge your sequence number. Sin, sinak. But further, the server has a burden. It has to remember X and Y and state. It allocates memory. Remember, reluctant allocation. The server receives a request to open a TCP connection and as a result allocates some resources in order to remember this information. Then Eve goes to the server and says, Hi, I'd like to start a connection with you. My sequence number is X prime. And then the server says, all right, well, I'm a web server. This is what I do. I answer web requests. Here's my SYNAC, Y prime, X prime. Remember X prime, Y prime, state prime. Eve then goes, hi, I'd like to start a TCP connection with you. Here's my sequence number, X double prime. Server says, all right, that's my job. Y double prime, X double prime. I'm going to keep state... You can imagine that the server would get burdened remembering all of this information because Eve doesn't need to. Eve is insincere. Eve is not actually going to send the final act that ends the three-way handshake of TCP. Eve is just sending sins over and over and over, causing the server to have these half-open handshakes with state being reserved for each. Now, the server may say, I only allow 1,000 half-open handshakes. Great. But that also means that no one else can have a handshake. No one else can connect to the server. And e or the server's buffer filled with all of the memory that Eve is consuming prevents legitimate people from being able to initiate a TCP connection. This is a classic denial-of-service attack. The server must allocate resources for every sin that it receives. There's a timeout, for example, so it might keep them for three minutes. But Eve can just keep sending sins as frequently as she, 
Eve wants. And the cost of sending a packet is nothing for Eve because Eve doesn't maintain any memory associated with it. Whereas the server has to remember the sin in the act so as to finish the handshake. Or as to or rather to know when the handshake has been completed. And this prevents legitimate clients from being able to re connect and receive the website. Eventually, the server just runs out of storage, runs out of capacity to accept half-open connections, and refuses new ones until the ones in the buffer expire. But if Eve keeps sending new half-open handshakes and the server can't tell them apart, for instance, they come from different IPs, every sin comes from its own IP, they look legitimate, there's no way to tell just by looking at a sin whether or not this is coming from someone who wants to download the website or an attacker, especially if the IP address is forged, which is easy for the attacker to do because they have no intention of continuing communication. And depending on the implementation of the TCP stack, it may even spawn a thread for each request. Hopefully this is no longer the case now, but this illustrates these asymmetries in security. The server should not be allocating resources Certainly not a thread for every single TCP connection, for every SYN that it receives. So the SYN flood first done in 1994 to take down a server and then impersonate it. So it was a denial of service so that the server disappeared and then another attack could uh, step in to replace it. A solution to this is known as SYN cookies. This was proposed in 1996 by Daniel Bernstein, DJB. And the idea was to offload state to the client. So instead of the server wasting its resources with storing state, it offloaded it to the client. And it's extremely clever. So what happens was, Instead of storing the state, it just used as its reply sin a deterministic function based on information that it would otherwise have to store. So the Eve goes to the server and says, here's my sin. And the server says, all right, here's my sin. And instead of storing all of the information it has to store, it just expects to get back from the from E, from the person doing the connection, the correct SIN number, which it can then confirm represents the same information. Because it's an HMAC of the address, the port, the address, uh, the other side's address and port, and the time. And the secret, known only by the server, means that only the server could compute this SIN number. So when the ACK comes, so SYN, SYN, ACK, ACK, when the final ACK in the three-way handshake comes and the server receives it, it can look at the SYN number that it had told the person connecting to that was its SYN number and realize whether or not it's the correct value by computing this HMAC again. And as long as no one knows the secret, this scheme will work. And no state is stored with the scheme. The server just replies immediately with this HMAC value as its SYN, and if it doesn't hear back with the same SYN number, it doesn't. it's not bothered at all. There's no actual storage on its end. So, a question to think about. Why does this fix the problem? The attacker can, after all, just answer with the SYNAC reply with the actual cookie, right? The attacker receives the cookie from the server. It can just reply back. And yes, I mean, it can do that, but that's the idea is that at this point, it would actually be a legitimate connection. The idea is that the server isn't actually wasting any resources if it's a legitimate client, 
then they will reply with the correct value. And if it's a sin flood, there's no wasted storage on the server side. So the idea of a sin flood simply fails. Now it's just a classic DOS attack where it's one side's bandwidth against the other side's bandwidth. Not this idea where by doing a small amount of bandwidth, you can make a server waste a huge amount of resources and stop accepting co connections from other other users. Right? It solves the problem by removing this asymmetry where an attacker can force a server to waste resources. Another defense is random deletion, which is that if your operating system buffer of incoming TCP connections is full, then you simply delete a random one. Normally, or at least the initial implementations, would they'd run out so they'd stop accepting new ones. But you could also just delete a random one. And if you are being sin flooded, you have a good chance of actually deleting one that's, you know, sin flooding you. So it's it's an easy to implement solution. Another defense, you use a proxy server. So here, you offload the creation of TCP connections to some other entity, like Cloudflare or something, where they are responsible for establishing TCP connections, doing the three-way handshake, and if they ascertain that the connection is from a legitimate client who wants to download this web page, they then forward that on to you. But the sin cookies remain uh, an elegant and simple way of solving this problem of the sin flood. In conclusion, for TCP, we have The attacker who can observe TCP can manipulate it quite easily. If you know the ports and the sins, you can inject data arbitrarily. You can adjust sequence numbers to avoid being detected. So Bob sends Bob's reply. You can, If you've injected some traffic, you can increment Bob's uh, sin numbers and increment the acknowledgements appropriately so Bob's none the wiser and Alice is none the wiser. You can just terminate them with reset packets, arbitrarily disable communication. An attacker who can predict the initial sequence numbers, because they're not actually random but just based on a clock, can also blind spoof these connections. An attacker could also regular spoof them, but they their probability of success is going to be 2 and two to the 32. Not impossible, for sure, but certainly not trivial. If it was meant to be impossible, it would be cryptographically secure, 128-bit. And if you can predict the initial sequence numbers, then you can, for instance have an entire TCP communication that would otherwise be undetected if you can anticipate what the server replies with and, and then send the, the reply to that that they would expect. And this allows you to frame someone in a sense or avoid detection. If you wanted to do an attack and you wanted to make it not appear as though it was coming from you, you would then just use someone else's IP as long as you didn't actually need to know what the replies to the server were. If it was just simply a matter of issuing a command to the server so that it did something and all the server did was acknowledge it or, or send some confirmation, then it wouldn't matter what their reply actually was as long as you knew what command to tell them. And of course, there's this denial of service attack based on the sin flood.
So many issues with TCP, it wasn't designed with security in mind, and in assignment three, you'll do a bunch of these attacks in practice.